Hello, hello. Welcome to this edition of the Cancer Coach Talks. I'm your host, Leslie Nance. And tonight, we're going to talk about living your life despite cancer, to despite disease. And I am so excited to share this topic with you. We're also going to be honoring one of our community members this evening, and I'll get to that in just a little bit later in this broadcast. But before I do that, let me introduce myself. My name is Leslie Nance. I'm a certified holistic nutritionist, certified holistic, <coughs> excuse me, cancer coach, and an eight-year cancer survivor. And I come here on two, sorry, scared me, something fell. Let me fix that. <laughs> something over here uh, fell out of the way. Sorry about that. Um, I come here on Tuesday nights teaching you how to adjust your lighting so that it doesn't fall off of its little stand. <laughs> that was so weird. It just went punk. Um, but I come here on Tuesday nights teaching you how to create an inhospitable environment to cancer and to disease and really to share with you what I know about healing the body through mindset, through nutrition, and uh, really specifically about setting your mind to that, to that principle, really tuning in to what creates healing in your life. So thank you so much for being here with me. I certainly appreciate it. If, you, uh, if you're here with us live, be sure to leave us a comment. I do not know that you're here or who specifically is here unless you do leave us a comment. So make sure that you uh, leave us a comment over in the, in the comment section here. If you're watching this replay on uh, Facebook or over on YouTube uh, or on my website or wherever you may be watching it from, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to uh, be here with you this evening. So tonight I want to talk about something, and I think that this is very appropriate uh, to talk about the specific subject when um, it did it again. We're just going to leave it there. Uh, to talk about the specific subject when we are thinking about leaving out of one year and going into a, another year and to really leaning into the wisdoms of this transition period. And this is one of my favorite weeks of the year. Leaving out of Christmas and going into the new year, um, I love ending my year in celebration uh, with my family and really spending some time in that space um, of, of gratitude and love and joy. And then transitioning into this new marker, if you will, because really nothing changes. It's like a placeholder um, in our in our yearly in our in our lives, basically. A new year is very much in uh, very much like a placeholder where it holds we hold space for that time of transition from one year to another year, although really nothing ever changes. Um, that quickly our, our moves that quickly where we see a distinction from one year to another. But it's really good to mark that presence and to use this week. I use this week mostly for reflection and spending time in that uh, reflection of the previous year and really paying attention to what my body and soul and energy is asking me for to think about in the new year. And so that's what the week is like for me. And maybe it's different for everybody. A lot of people just have the entire week off. And so they're spending it in joy and gratitude and relaxation, which is awesome as well. I've had a few days off myself, which was really great. Um, so, but what I'm going to talk about tonight is living a life despite cancer. So I see a bunch of you are joining in. Hi, Jennifer. It's good to have you. It's good to see you again today. <laughs> Hi, Ellie. Hi, Kathy. Hello, Anne-Marie. Hi, Rosette. It's so good to have each and every one of you here. Happy New Year to every single one of you. Um, I want to pose an idea here this evening about, and, and kind of, kind of, kind of almost like a little bit of a, um, a light bulb, hopefully, and not a slap in the face, but more like a light bulb um, to turn on in this instance and shed a little light on an idea that I has been rolling around in my mind for quite a while. And I've actually been waiting to share um, at the end of the year. And that is the idea that we stop living our life uh, when we are diagnosed with cancer. And if you are, if, if you've stopped living your life because of a cancer diagnosis, that is because cancer is bossing you around. And so I think it's important to describe what a normal life looks like. And I know that I can't say like X, Y, Z, you know, because it's different for every single person. 
but I'm just going to kind of give you some average ideas about what an average, um, you know, what human qualities consist of in life. And that is for most of us working, whether it's uh, working, uh, taking care of our grandchildren, that's a shout out for you, Anne-Marie, whether it's, uh, whether it's working on our health, whether it's working around the house, whether it's working in a job, uh, whether it's working on relationships, whatever, working is part of human life. Um, play as well. So having time to play and to energize and to have something to look forward to. Most of us look forward to play, not necessarily looking forward to work, although I very much look forward to my work. So I'm in that weird category. Um, sleeping, that's something that we all need, right? We need to make sure that we're getting some sleep um, every single day. Um, eating would be another part of that. You have to eat. You could not survive if you were not eating. So that's really important to human life. Um, spending time with people that matter in your life. So going more towards the emotional stance, making sure that we're spending time with people that we love and people that we enjoy. Um, and you notice that I didn't just say family because not all of us come from a healthy family structure. And so that doesn't, those are not the people that matter most to us sometimes. And that is okay, by the way. Um, we get to pick our friends. We don't always get to pick our families. And so uh, sometimes that means a group of friends. Uh, it means a group of people that support you and love you through processes. Um, it could just mean a particular type of community maybe that you belong to, but be, spending time with people that matter in your life, um, I think is really important. Making memories also very important. Um, and I'm specifically speaking of good memories, although we do make bad memories as well, um, but making memories is part of human life. And so these are kind of the, what defines living life as a human being. Is that if anybody has anything to add to that list, I would love to hear it. So please feel free to add that, whatever you're thinking, um, maybe that I missed off of that list. You're like, oh, 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 you should have said, right? <laughs> I should have said this. Um, please feel free to add that in the comments. I see a whole bunch of you also jumped in. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Hayden. It's good to see you. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Janice. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so if you have anything that you want to add to that list, then I would encourage you to do so. So what happens when we are diagnosed with cancer is that those basics of life, those and maybe even more that I had have not described here this evening, but those basics of life actually begin to feel like a hassle, right? Sleeping, eating, um, <laughs> spending time with people, um, you know, it, it, those basic, those basic things we begin to ignore and all of our attention gets placed elsewhere. Um, it gets placed in a, in a, in a, in a circumstance as opposed to focusing, living our life. And, you know, my question around that is that if it feels like a hassle, then maybe it's because we're replacing normal life right? We're replacing what we consider normal life with this new cancer life. And so, you know, the things that I described before get taken up with treatments. Um, it gets taken up with doctor's appointments. It gets taken up with scans. Um, it gets taken up with researching endless hours upon endless hours looking for an answer. Um, some of us get a development of a condition called orthorexia, Orthorexia is actually an unhealthy focus on eating healthy. <laughs> Isn't that crazy that there's actually a thing? I'm actually going to talk about this with my, um, in the new year, I'm going to talk about this with my uh, clients next week is talking specifically about orthorexia and how to make sure that we're avoiding it because that's not a healthy space to be in. And so having unhealthy thoughts about eating healthy food is not a good space to be. So sometimes that takes up um, space in our lives, and we develop this unhealthy relationship uh, with healthy food. Uh, depression can actually set in. Um, you know, we replace, we we disengage with those people that really mean the most to us uh, because of depression or anger or embarrassment or any one of those negative emotions that can come forward. And so these things begin to take over our regular normal life. And when we replace our regular normal life with these things, we begin to allow the allowance of cancer to run the show. 
We are fighting so hard for a life that we're not even taking time to live. We put all our eggs in one basket, trying to save something that we're not even enjoying in the moment. And I tried to think of other circumstances where we might do this, where a human being might do this. And I have to tell you, I had a hard time coming up with another extraordinary circumstance that would cause this reaction in one's life. There are some instances where you might retract. Maybe you lost a loved one, a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, and we retract and we live in mourning for a little while. We live in sadness. We live in anger sometimes. And those things get replaced temporarily with the details of that. But not to the degree where we're replacing parts of our lives with in an effort to save the very thing that we're ignoring. And today in my client group session, we talked about living with attention. Now, you've probably heard of living with intention. Dr. Wayne Dreyer was actually a um, a, a, a huge, um, uh, what am I trying to say, thought leader when it comes to living with intention, being intentional about your life. And I, as I was describing to my clients this morning in our group session, I said, you know, and this was like an hour long session about this particular subject. So there's a lot of detail there. But I, I was talking about the fact that we, we um, to, to live with intention, if we don't have the attention, living with attention, then it can make living with intention very stressful. And so we talked a little bit more about that and, 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 and really being mindful about our lives. And so I read them a story about a man who discovered uh, his, his, that his healing was indeed living through his life and paying attention to his needs, to the very life that he was working so hard to save. And, and having that kind of detail, having that kind of light bulb that switches on really can change how we navigate through our journey. Imagine, if you will, that you are, you know, you, you have to go for treatments or you have to go for scans and, and you've had a beautiful weekend with your family. You went out hiking, you went out for, uh, you went out and had a, a, a lovely dinner. I know we're very, it's very difficult right now. And some of my examples do not hold water because of COVID. Uh, but I mean, normally, normally speaking, when this is all past, you know, we, we went out and you did something fun with the people that mean the most to you. And you really had a joyous time. Imagine going into treatments with that memory, with that normality, with that feeling that you're actually living the life that you are trying to save through the treatment process. That really helps you turn a corner into something much more bright, something much more achievable, something much more goal oriented because you would work harder to preserve that. But if you're constantly sitting in scan mode, treatment mode, not having fun, can't do that because I have cancer, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, you know, having all of these emotions around you, then <laughs> then you begin to wonder why you're trying to save this life and you begin to lose motivation and you begin to lose hope. Every single one of us has known somebody that was diagnosed with cancer and the doctor said, you have six months to live and they had, then they lived six months and they were gone. Every single one of us or live, you have two weeks to live and they lived two weeks and they were gone. And what happens is, is that we get so wrapped up in that information that we forget what we're trying to save. Don't do that. Don't allow yourself to be in that space. 
Allow yourself to live the life you are trying to save. Now, I realize that some of you may have limitations mobily. You have, may have limitations because of COVID, but it still doesn't mean that you can't continue to enjoy life. So my question to you tonight is, are you living the life right now that is worth living? Are you staying focused in that space right now so that you have something worth saving? I had an old car one time. I loved this old car. It was totally beat up. It was, it was junk. And, and I, I, I held on to it for so long uh, because it was the first car that I ever bought on my very own without my parents, without a husband, without anybody helping me. I bought this car on my very own and it was a little Volkswagen Cabriolet and it was a convertible and it was from like, you know, 1989. It was, and this was in the mid nineties. This car was already like, you know, maybe late nineties. This car was already like 10 years old by the time I got it. And, you know, Volkswagens are made to like run forever. In fact, I have, I own another Volkswagen right now. And so they're, they're just made to last and last and last and last. And this car was no exception to that, but it was a beater. It was a jalopy. It was, it was terrible. It stranded me so many times for so many little, just ridiculous things that would go wrong. And when it rained, the, 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 uh, the convertible top leaked uh, if you were sitting at a red light, not when you were driving, but if you sat in a red light too long, it would leak. I'd have to put a car cover over it if it was going to rain or put it underneath a carport or something so that it wouldn't get wet inside. And then sometimes it still got wet and it was just smelly. And ugh. I mean, it was just it was a total. I loved this car. This car was worth it to me. It had a sentimental attachment to me. And. <laughs> In Texas, uh, and I was living in Texas, I was living in Dallas at the time, I was young, and, um, and, and I had a really good job. I could, I could have afforded a different car. I just, for some reason, was super attached to this car. And in Texas, we get hailstorms that will destroy your car about every spring and every fall. <laughs> so every time a storm would come up, I would take this little car and like protect it as if it's like a Lamborghini or something. I would drive and sit in a hailstorm in a car wash or underneath a gasoline, a gas station, you know, to protect it. One day when I was at work, um, all the parking spaces that were inside in the parking garage were taken and I had to park on the top of the parking garage in my little car, which I didn't like to do because the sun it got really hot and didn't have a great air conditioner, you know, and it was a spring, it was spring. And um, I was working away, ha again, had a really good job and wasn't paying attention to the weather at all. I had been in a conference all day long. And when I came out, my little car was shredded. The hailstorm had come through. It beat the top off. It was just ridiculous. And my emotion around this, this little car I cried as if I had lost a loved one. It was just, and it, it, it the insurance was going to total it. It was only worth like $2,000, maybe on a good day, maybe not even that. And so they were going to total it. And I knew I would never get to drive my little car again. And I was so distraught over the loss of that car. And <laughs> When I got a new car, I was like, well, this car is really great, but it's not the old car. And I mourned that little car. I mourned what had happened to it. I mourned that I wasn't going to have it anymore. And it was just a thing. But I had made that car so worth living in and so worth living for that I gave it I gave it everything. I gave it my heart and soul. I made sure it was taken care of. I made sure that I, you know, that I did everything I could to preserve it. And it was so important to me. Eventually I got used to my new car and then started thinking about how silly I was to be so attached to it. 
But still to this day, if I see a little Volkswagen Cabriolet convertible from that time period drive by, I'm like, oh, cutie girl car. That's what my girlfriends called it. They called it the cutie girl car. I was the only one with the convertible. So I was cool, even though it was a piece of crap. And so, but I had built, I had built this life around this thing that did not have a lot of value, only value to me. It was worth it to me. It was worth it to keep that car, to, to preserve that memory, that feeling that I had around that little car. And so I'm asking you, are you creating that kind of passion in your life? where your life is so important to you that you'll do anything to protect it. You'll do anything to live it, that you will make time for it, that you will show up for it. This will make me cry, <laughs> but I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna honor one of our community members who died this past week. This will be a tough one for me. But if you knew that you only had a couple of days to live, would you be worried about your upcoming treatments or your upcoming doctor's appointments? Or would you spend every second protecting those two days and spending them in a way that was meaningful to you? How would you live? This week we had uh, a community member. One, actually, we had I had two losses this week in my life. Um, one was a client who was not active in our community. She lost her life um, to um, actually not her cancer, but to cancer treatments almost, I would say. Um, and uh, she will be missed greatly. And ironically, they're both named Jennifer. And um, Jennifer um, that you know here that has come here, that's done lives with me, um, she, Jennifer died on December 26th. And I share this message with you tonight in her honor because I can tell you that Jennifer would have told you, live your life. Don't sit on the sidelines because you have cancer. Don't stop life. Continue life. Every second of every day is precious. She had an 11 year encounter with cancer. And I only knew her the last part of her life, but even then she would show up. Whoops, now it fell completely. She would show up with a smile and a laugh when she was in pain, when she was scared, when she was angry, when she was frustrated. She would show up living life fully. And she would tell you, don't let it take over. It's not worth it. Manage it. Do what you need to do. Let it, you know, make sure you're doing your treatments. Make sure that you're eating well. Make sure you're paying attention to your mindset, you know. But don't, don't let it take over. Don't let it boss you around. Live your life. And she is not here to tell you that. But I am. Anne is also another example, Eugene. You're right. Anne earlier this year lost her life. And I talked to Anne three days before she died. And she was still telling me about all the stuff that she was doing all the things that she was cultivating, all the things that she was doing. And she knew she was dying. 
was amazing. We've all heard the story of the man who, you know, was worked, 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 worked and provided for his family and, and spent, you know, uh, spent so much time making money and, and preparing and making sure that his family was well cared for. And they had the best house and the best cars and they took the best vacations and his kids went to the best school. And on his deathbed, he didn't say, I wish I would have worked harder. I wish I would have worked more. He said, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I wish I would have known what was going to be important to me in this moment of my life. Don't stop living. You are fighting for a life. You should be living that life right now. Maybe it's not the life that you're used to. Maybe it's different. But you can't put aside the things that you are that 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 you're meeting up with. That you're doing all of these things, creating all of these things for. I had a client that came to me one time. She was at our end of life. She knew that when she came to me. Um, and she actually ended up getting kicked out of hospice. She was in hospice when she came to me <laughs> and she ended up getting kicked out and, um, <laughs> I've had like three clients that that's happened to actually. Um, and she ended up getting kicked out of hospice, uh, and was sent home because she was too well to be in hospice. And she, her daughter and her. Um, went, her daughter went to a thrift store and excuse the elaborate story, but her daughter went to a thrift store and bought one of those hospital tables. Like you get at a hospital bed and her son made it where her sewing machine would fit on that. So she could lay in bed and sew because she loved to sew. And, um, and, and, and she had quit. She had not sewn in like a year. And I, why did you quit? And she's like, well, I don't know. I just, you know, other things, uh, have cancer and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. If it brings you joy, you should be sewing. Okay. She said, okay, I'm going to do it. I can't hardly leave my bed, but I'm going to do it. So she, so she, there she did. She just went on and she sewed, 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 sewed. And she made a quilt for her granddaughter. And um, she made a, I can't remember all the things that she made. She made these like sentimental things um, because she knew that she was dying and she was like, this is a piece of me that I can leave for them, that they can remember that I made specifically for them and that I was tough and that I had grit and that I could lay in my bed, sit up in my bed and sew. And she did. She could only sew for about 10, 15 minutes at a time. That's okay. She would just move the table off to the side and then she'd move it back when she was ready to go again. She did not stop living her life, even though she knew that she was dying. And the day before she died, she called me. She said, Leslie, I think this is it. And I said, I said, I understand. And so we talked about how she would approach her family that evening and the things that she would say. And we had already been working on that a little bit anyway. And uh, to, I, so I, I told her I loved her and that I hope that I got to speak with her again. And if I didn't, just you know, know how much I love you. And two days after that, I got a phone call from her daughter and she said, when mom died, when they put her in hospice, mom never smiled. She was completely removed from life. She had removed herself. She didn't want to see her grandchildren. She didn't want to, she didn't want to engage with anybody. She was just, she was only interested in dying. And she said, and when she started working with you and you started challenging her and telling her, why aren't you sewing? Why aren't you you know, why aren't you doing the things that you love? Why aren't you engaging? Why aren't you telling, reading stories to your granddaughter? Why aren't you just doing the things that you can do? I know it's not your normal life, but do the things you can do. And she said when her mother died, that she had the most beautiful smile on her face and that everybody only remembered her with that smile and how much and how graceful she was when she left. And the other night I was watching, we were watching Forrest Gump. That's what we watched on Christmas night, I think. Maybe the day, I don't, I think it was, I can't remember. I think it was Christmas night, actually. 
we were we were watching for it was Christmas night. We were watching Forrest Gump and um, when his mother dies, which always makes me cry. And she said, and he said, why are you, why are you dying? What's happening, mama? Why are you dying? And she said, Forrest, it's just my time. This is just it. It was so beautiful. It was, it was, and I know that's just a movie. And I told Robin in that moment, I said, I hope when it's my time, when it's, cause everybody's going to leave this planet that that's how I feel, that it's just my time. Now, I'm sorry to get deep on the death subject, but I think not enough people talk about it. I think we leave it so taboo. That, and especially when we have cancer, we don't want to talk about it because, oh my God, what if it happens to me? It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to all of us. It's something that we have to come to grips with. And so preparing our heart, preparing that space, but while we're here, while we're in this moment, making sure that we are living and that we're paying attention, we're being mindful and that we are, we are living the life that we are working to save. So Jennifer, this one's for you, babe. Both Jennifers, this one's for you. I will love you, miss you. You both were shining examples of cancer process. And a lot of people will say that you lost. I don't ever think you lost a thing, either one of you. Either one of you. All right. Woo. Happy New Year. <laughs> Don't wish your life away. Everybody's like, oh, I'm so ready for this year to be over. Don't wish your life away. If you want something to change, then change it. If you want something to be different, then make it different. You are the architect of your life. Nobody else. Nobody else sets the rules. You set the rules for how you want to live. It's funny because I actually, my husband had to teach me that. <laughs> I was not very good at that. I was very much a rule player. I let everybody set the rules around me. And he actually taught me to be different um, in that respect. And when I started living that and realizing that I was the architect, that I was the one in charge, everything became different everything, my life really became worth living at that point. So 